Hi, and welcome to another episode of Can This Marriage Be Saved? I'm Rifka Slatkin. Hi, and I'm Shlomo Slatkin. And we're here with another great episode, so thanks for tuning in. So I've been hearing Harville Hendricks, the founder of Imago Therapy, say something recently, and he's been saying it for years, and for some reason I only seem to pay attention to it now. But it's causing me... It, it, gave me a major aha moment, but it's also causing me to reevaluate and question my entire life. Oh, <laughs> so wow. I need you to settle me down slow mo. Yeah, that's a big thing. It is. So I'll tell you what it is. And I feel like every few years we tune in and we tell you guys stuff that's going on in our own marriage, in our own life. And we maybe have this huge epiphany, but this is one of those episodes. Okay, so Harville talks a lot about anxiety. He talks about anxiety being what? The ultimate... How does he phrase it? The well, ultimate relationship killer, or how, how does he talk about well, it? Well, I mean, I think he starts he starts from the from birth that you know parenting, and if you have attuned parenting that is warm and available, then that impacts the infant's brain and helps them feel safe. And then, if you have the opposite of that, then that's where the problems start. And he gives a shows a video of the still talk about the still face experiment. Yes, the yeah. still face experiment. You can Google it, and perhaps we'll put a link to it in the chat or in the um, in the comments section. It's essentially a video of a scientist. A mother comes in with her baby, and they do an experiment where what if she turns away from the baby, turns back to the baby with a complete still face, no smile, no reaction. What happens? So she's just staring at the baby with this completely still face or she just ignores the baby also versus versus and playing with the baby and seeing the reaction on the baby so in this video when she becomes a still face the baby starts to point to things trying to get his mother's attention the baby it's a girl it's a girl sorry <laughs> the baby starts to like flail her arms this makes a lot of noise she shrieks and then ultimately, like, her body kind of collapsed and she has a tantrum. And then the mother turns back to her and the experiment is yeah. over. And this is something that, that that we repeat as adults in our relationships. Uh, we've talked about this before. Sometimes we make a lot of noise to get attention when our partner is not available. Sometimes we just shut down when we're not getting our needs met. But this all comes back from this initial anxiety that we had from growing up. And the more, the more we have unattuned parenting... And we talk about this a lot in our workshop. The more we have unattuned parenting, the more we have childhood baggage that we bring into our marriage, and it plays itself out in the interactions that we have in all of our in our on all of our relationships, and particularly in the marriage, because we're trying to get our needs met. We ultimately we the thing we need most as human beings is connection. It's a kind of a non negotiable. And when we don't get that connection, then we act out. And that's all the bad behavior that we have in a relationship. So it's, it kind of simplifies things in a way. You know, everybody wants to figure out what's wrong with this marriage, what's wrong with this person, what dis disorder do they have. And, and really, it's the bad behavior is a protest against the lack of connection, which is something that we need just like food and drink. Wow. There's so much to unpack here, but I just want to be clear that the word you're using is attunement. What does that actually mean? What does that look like when you are attuned to your child? I guess in this case, attuned parent. So what what, what are the different types? Are there different types of attunement or like what does it look like? What I guess what would be an example of being attuned versus not being attuned? Well, like um, paying attention to your child, trying to understand what they need, being fully present for them, not being distracted as opposed to what a lot of us are these days on our devices and not really fully there. We're, our lives are busy. We have a lot going on. We have a lot of stress. And then the technology doesn't help either because we're, you know, we're like this and our child's talking to us and trying to get our attention. We're not really there for them. Well, I was born in the 80s. <laughs> so my parents were not on their cell phones. So I'm I'm thinking right, that it wasn't just that right. It wasn't yeah, just but, the although the technology, although that's a huge issue issue for our generation. But it's even worse, and I worry about what's what will be like in the next in the next generation, the children of this of the technology age. But okay, for our parents' generation, I'm a little bit older than her, but not much. People have their own issues. People have their own 
baggage. I mean, again, it's just like, it's a tradition that we pass on from generation to generation until we get it right. People are wounded, people have challenges, they pass it on. They have their anxiety, they're not fully available. People are worried about people having marriage problems, people are having money problems, people are fighting in their relationship. There's so much that can be going on that they bring that anxiety to the table. And then because they're so self-absorbed in their own stuff, they can't really be there fully for someone else. And that's what happens that, you know, just thinking about like us as parents, forget about the technology. We have our own things about that are going on and anxieties and stress, and it's not always possible. I mean, anyone could do it perfectly. Like don't get all like anxious now about, <laughs> you know, you ruin your children. But, you know, every child is going to feel some of it to some degree, but we can definitely diminish it because by learning how to be present, learning how to not get triggered, learning how to deal with our own issues so that we can be there for our kid and not get reactive all the time. So putting it all together, I think like when I'm thinking about my life, I always attribute our challenges and our marriage to witnessing my parents' uh, horrible marriage and then their divorce. But what I'm thinking about now is because the problems didn't go away once they, once they got a divorce, and I always try to understand like, what in the world? Why was I so impacted by this event? Um, I think that, yes, divorce was hard and separation and the whole thing was awful. But underneath it, knowing that their problems didn't end once the divorce was finalized, I really think the nasty culprit here was anxiety because I feel like that is the piece that that got into me and stayed with me all these years. And that is the piece, that's why I'm freaking out. That is the piece that I think has plagued me. And then as a result, when we've had challenges in our marriage and then any struggles I've had with our five kids, I think come from anxiety. And I'm realizing like this huge aha moment, um, just how much impact my parents' anxiety and their parents' anxiety had on me. And I keep, and I'm passing down anxiety and like the buck has to stop here. Right. So it creates an anxious brain. You know, all these things like, you know, AD, why does everybody have ADHD nowadays? You know, and it's like, did they not have it before or, or all these other disorders that people have? If you have that anxious brain, then it's, then you're anxious and then you're anxious with your kids and then your kids are always stressed out all the time and then their, their brain's not feeling safe and it just doesn't lead to optimal performance or existence. And we all have, I mean, I also, I mean, I have a very different childhood situation, but I have my own, you know, as a person, I have things that I'm, I'm anxious about. But when we, when it, that becomes a real issue. I, I really want you guys, listeners, to not gloss over this like I did for so many years. Because, yeah, anxiety has become such a... Uh, a buzzword it's used all the time i feel like it's synonymous with when the doctors say you need lots of sleep like i feel like anxiety also number one killer like it's like my eyes just sort of glaze over it but really understanding what it is i think also might be helpful to our listeners i remember my first experience or exposure to anxiety was when a friend you know back when we were in high school said i'm going on medication for anxiety and i'm thinking why would you do that like it's normal to have nervous feelings and I didn't understand the condition. Um, if you want to share more, I, and there's nothing wrong with medication for anxiety. That might actually be a missing piece for you in your life. If if you've done everything, and we'll talk about ways to mitigate this anxiety and how to show up in relationship where we can calm it down. But there's nothing wrong with medication. And perhaps for some of you, it might be a missing link, right? Yeah, I mean, this. sometimes people try other things like mindfulness, meditation, uh, you know, natural remedies. Sometimes that works for people. Sometimes people try medication. Um, sometimes therapy can help with that. But because the rela the, the anxiety is a relational and is really from relationship, you know, being in that anxious relationship with a relationship with an anxious person, then the best way to be able to heal that anxiety is through relationship. Mm. So being able to have a safe relationship where you can, be there for each other where you can feel heard, where you, you know, a lot of what we teach in, in the process in the Mago therapy, just to be present for each other. It's a lot of what we do is not about like, it's not about like fixing a problem. It's not about, it's about just ha teaching you how to be with each other in the same way you want your parents to have been with you in a tuned way, a safe way, a validating way. And I believe that 
as we do that, it helps us change our brain so that our brain can become calm and more safe. And, I mean, you can answer that if you feel like that's helped you over the time um, because of the work we've done, if it's helped you be less anxious or not. Oh, for sure. So our story, if you're not familiar with it already, is that we're married. How many years are we married? It'll be, it'll be 23. <laughs> 23 years this August. And when we first got married, uh, a year, like when we had our first child, a year and a half, let's say, after we got married, we started having challenges. It was impacted also, compact, compounded by the fact that we weren't sleeping well with a newborn. And but, then the anxiety about, oh, is the baby going to sleep enough? Is the baby eat enough? All the, the yeah. anxieties dealing with a fragile newborn. Right. So and then anxiety we, there. <laughs> yeah. Looking, we can probably go over every instance when we had challenges and ask ourselves, what was the anxiety level at that time? When we had like a major, you know, had, when we have come to head about really big issues. I'm thinking about all of them right now, like quick, really quickly, <laughs> and it, it all comes down. Yeah, it all, a lot of it comes down to the anxiety, anxiety about the kids, is anything about, you know, for not finances, all these type of things. It, it really goes back to that, and that when, when you're anxious, and you're in, you go back into that survival mode, so you're not really thinking rationally. You're not really, like, you're temporarily insane, so to speak, and you're not going to be able to make good decisions, and the dialogue process helps slow things down so you get out of that insane brain and get into a more intentional brain. I mean, you can become more intentional. You can think about things from a more rational perspective instead of just a knee-jerk reactive perspective. Wow. I know Harville says, like, the brain... How does he phrase it? The brain can't fully develop properly with an environment of constant anxiety. Yeah. And... So think about it. If you grew up in a home that was very reactive or just lots of undercurrents of anxiety, think back to your life. We'll spare you our 20 year, you know, 20 plus years. Like think back to your life and the major turning points in your life and ask yourself, what were the anxieties of the time, of the moment in that situation? And maybe even doing some work looking back, some journaling, we have worksheets on anxiety to help you, you can get, you can get to self guide, to have a, a, an activity for yourself to guide yourself, but maybe question what was going on at the time so that you can see it from a whole new perspective. And then when you are in relationship with somebody else, use the opportunity that you have of being in a relationship to say to your partner, honey, I am having a lot of thoughts about things and how they've transpired and things we've fought about in the past. And I'd really love to have a dialogue with you to share some of those feelings about that. When would be a good time, right? And then you, as you self-regulate, you help regulate each other. And there's, as we said, there's also things you can do on your own to help yourself become more calm and be more trusting and, and not live in fear constantly. All of these things you can work on personally, which will help you in your relationship. But if you have a willing partner who's willing to do this work together, it's even better because you can do it together. Say more about the regulating each other because that's fascinating. Um, I mean, if your brains are, it's like you're both, <laughs> if you, you both have like your, bo if both people's brains are not regulated and you're, you know, like your amygdala has been hijacked and you're just completely like a reactive brain, uh, you're just going to keep firing off of each other and pushing each other. But when you both get calm, then you help calm the other person down. Because when you're like this, for example, like when we're mirroring the other, when I'm mirroring you and I'm a calm, stable presence, as opposed to an anxious presence, you can feel seen, you can feel heard. You don't need to get my attention by making a lot of noise or, or shutting down. You, you can be calmed down and like take, take it down a level and vice versa. Yeah, that's really powerful. And I and I think that's why we have couples sit across from each other, right? Making eye contact face to face. Sometimes you have couples, Shlomo's the therapist, and he works with couples privately in two day intensive formats. And we also work with couples in a group, but we have couples when they dialogue, we have them sit across from each other. We have them make eye contact. Sometimes we have them hold hands after the conversation is over even if it's around something frustrating we can invite them to give each other a, a, a little six second yeah. hug 
Um, those are all ways physical and not physical Connection. body language. To, get, to create con safe connection. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it, it just really was mind blowing to hear more about the impact of anxiety. And I know that I would love for us to continue to dialogue frequently so we can tone down some of the anxiety and in our home, in our relationship and show up fully present for the kids. Deal. <laughs> <laughs> Anything yeah. else you want to share with our, our listeners and our viewers? Yeah, look, it's, it takes, it's, there's no magic pill, you know, it takes time to override years and years of, of behavior. We're talking about not just your relationship, we're talking about from birth. So it takes time to do that, but it is possible to improve and it's possible to make things better. And it's just, I think the first step is commitment, uh, commitment to taking ownership for how your response, how your behavior impacts the other people. As opposed to blaming other people, as opposed to blaming on your spouse, as opposed to blaming it on your children or blaming it on your parents. You know, the situation is what it is. Everyone did the best job they could. And now your job on this earth is to be able to take your experiences and learn how to improve yourself to be the best person you can be. And when you can work on yourself, you will improve all of your relationships too. Because if you show up as someone who's safe and someone who's calm, as opposed to someone who's anxious, then you're going to have someone, you're going to have a ripple effect on your spouse and your children as well. So you're saying don't wait for the other person. Like don't wait for the other person to be better, to do better, to say better, to act better. Right. Like, be the change be, you want to see, right? Be the change exactly. you want to see instead of waiting for it to happen because it's not going to happen on its own and you'll be waiting a long time if you expect someone else to. Yeah, we just, I just had this, I think, with one of our kids. I was feeling very frustrated by her behavior. I think maybe it was compounded by that she had some sleepless nights and she wasn't her best self. And I was finding myself really triggered, really reactive because of her reactivity. And I found myself pulling away from wanting to spend time with her. And finally, I told myself, you are the mother. It is not her job to come to me, to apologize, to explain, to be better. She's a child. I am the parent and yes, while I'm not gonna allow certain behaviors to go on unchecked in our home, ultimately it was up to me. So I reached out, even though I didn't want to, I reached out, hey, do you wanna go um, return a pair of shoes that I have to return? You know, we had a great time and then we went to a little beauty shop and she was so excited to buy a hair detangler. Like it's the little things, but if I wouldn't have showed up and if I would have continued to be resentful and pulling away, then every single day would have just made things worse. Yeah. So I didn't wait. And that's, emo that's what emotional maturity is all about because you could have easily done the opposite, but you decided, you know what, instead of waiting for her to change or saying, woe is me and how horrible my life is, you took action, you tried to be the better person and you made an impact. Maybe it doesn't sound so good to you guys, but I was really triggered by... Now, I saw the whole thing. I mean, I know about the whole story, so I... I mean, she, yeah, she can be sharp can with see. her words and I'm sensitive, but she, but again, I'm the parent, she's the child. So yes. in a marriage though, how would you, if, if you were feeling really angry with your husband for days, let's say, days and you're just kind of sitting there pulling away silently like well he did this and well so it's harder because right if you can say okay i'm the parent so like that's my job but i would say even in a relationship your only job is to control yourself you cannot control anyone else if you want this relationship to be better the only thing you can do is to make yourself better mm. and it's a hard thing and nobody wants to hear it and it's a lot easier to blame other people for sure but you, know, you got to you have to man up or woman up <laughs> and, 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 show work, up. and work on, yeah, show up the way that you want to be. You're, what do you want to be? Who, who do you want to be in this relationship? It doesn't matter what you did or didn't do. Who do you want to be? It's, it's stop hard. Stop making excuses, yeah. Stop making excuses. I mean, that's hard. It's hard. It's, and I'm sure we're going to get lots of comments. Well, what if my spouse is a narcissist and what if he's a this and a that and yeah that's also true right i mean is it, it it doesn't have to be yes no maybe it's 
and and. Look, I mean, anyone can choose. <laughs> you can choose what's intolerable and what you're willing to willing to deal with. But at the same time, I believe I believe we are putting again, unless you're in danger. Uh, I mean, we, you know, everyone always asks these type of questions to kind of like a stump the rest. stump us here. <laughs> but uh, you know. Most of the situations are not like that, even though it seems like everyone has the same question. No, most of the situations are not like that. And unless someone is like is physically abusive and you're in physical danger, uh, most cases, unless someone's psychotic, most cases can improve. And, but, and ultimately, it's your choice. We're not telling you what to do. It's your choice what you're willing to tolerate in a relationship. And you can feel like you've done everything you can and nothing changes and you know, that's your prerogative. At the same time, what we are saying is people who are having, uh, frust- it, we, I would say we, we're coming from the opposite perspective that people call it quits too equal, too or too easy. They give up. People, our generation, we're just, I would say we're a little bit weak. So um, we're not used to adversity. We're not used to struggling. We're not used to uh, the challenge. And I think this is something that we're lacking and it's something that we could benefit from really like taking things into our own hands and doing what, what we can to make the situation better. Because we it's a relationship. So even though we're not responsible for someone else's behavior, we are we do trigger the other person's behavior. And if we can work on our end, then they won't, and they're not triggered, then they're not gonna show up in that bad way either. That, what Shlomo just said, kind of sums up our whole clinical modality of therapy called Imago therapy, where we view the problems in the relationship, not you are this and I am this. It's the space between. So like Shalom was saying, if you're triggering, right, then the other person's going to react a certain way. And then if, so it's the dance. And if you can help be the first one to start working to clean out the pollution in this space, all the negativity, all the toxicity, the shame, the blame, the criticism, if you can stop that, chances are your partner's going to reflect what you're putting out there. Yeah, because if, if you're both littering, so <laughs> there's going to be a lot of trash. So you could say he did more trash, I did less trash, but you still, they're not going to want to be in that trash, in, in, a, in a dump. So you clean up your side and... Or, and right, and, and chances are, hopefully, see, see what happens. So that's a lot. We talked a lot um, about, we started off with anxiety. Right, and how, the aha moment. The aha moment, realizing that it still plagues me and it comes from childhood and it comes from my parents' childhood and their parents' childhood. And at some point it has to stop because it's making it impossible to have a clear mind and to show up as my best self. And I wanted to spare all of our listeners and viewers some years of behaving that way and really assessing and thinking back about pivotal uh, moments, maybe of conflict and really understanding what was going on at the time. What were the anxious feelings at the time? Could could I see it now from a bird's eye view? There's birds in here everywhere. Maybe maybe that's triggering the the wallpaper. But anyway, so the bird's eye view, and then I and then we talked about how the best way to deal with the anxiety isn't just situational. The anxiety is relational because mm-hmm. it's how you were parented, and yeah. and the way to and the way to heal that is through relationship. And Not, that, right. right. So, I mean, even though you can do a lot of work on your own anxiety, but it's even more powerful if you can work together with your partner to calm each other down, to experience someone as safe. It's very reparative, restorative, because it's like you're the person who probably most reminds me of my my, my parents based on our whole theory here that we, we've talked about before. But to, to re-experience the relationship with someone, with your closest human relationship, and to feel safety that can repair that and I mean, it, it rewires our brain. Yes, and that's how we were able to get through many years of ups and downs is doing the Imago dialogue, is showing up for each other with appointments and then following our three-step process of mirroring, validation, empathy, making eye contact, having those appointments to connect and those pop- positive times to get through the anxious times. And then Doing so can help you create experiences that are connecting and calm and relational. Like I said with our daughter, 
showing up even if the other person isn't showing up as their best self. And even when you don't feel like it, and even when you think the other person is really wrong, at fault, what do you have to lose by, by showing up your best self? Right. And, and Shlomo talked about, you know, really deciding how you want to be, how you want to live, what's your purpose here, and getting some personal training. <laughs> like, really, if you go to the gym, you, you don't necessarily want to work out, but you show up because you know you want to get stronger. So that's, that's today's episode. And like always, we, we will have opportunities for you to strengthen your muscles. You can always contact us to do a two-day private intensive. If you decide enough is enough, I want to rewire my brain and change the patterns in our relationship, you can always schedule one on demand in a location near you or virtually. Or you can attend one of our Getting the Love You Want workshops, our group workshops that happen a few times a year. Yeah, we have them quarterly in Baltimore. We also have an online one coming up this fall. And we also have exotic retreats. Costa Rica and other fantastic locations. So thank you for watching and listening. It was a wonderful episode and we can't wait to see you on the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.